It's a little bit different than what I have normally done. Uh, last year, I gave you a fairly detailed history of the Philadelphia experiment and how it tied into the Phoenix project. Today, my intent is somewhat different. I wish to show the background connections between the two projects, how they happened, the politics that was involved, and the interlocking uh, controls, if you will, and the communication which resulted in the two tests locking to each other, how this really occurred and why, and what other problems were developed because of this. It's a rather involved story, but I only have 45 minutes, so I will again try to keep this rather brief. As you know, the Philadelphia experiment culminated in two tests for the Eldridge, or if you don't know it, I'll state it now. The original 22 July 1943 test for the Eldridge, which was bad enough in terms of the personnel problem, but did not lock up to the Phoenix project. And the final test, 12 August 1943, in which the ship went into hyperspace and it was a total disaster when it came back. And the nature of that disaster actually was far greater than anyone realizes. And the potential was unbelievably bad. I wish to go into that and what happened and how it was averted. The Phoenix Project actually has been covered very well by Preston Nichols. And he will be going into some of that today and some resurrection of the technology and how it worked. So I will not go into that at all. I really don't understand what happened in terms of the politics and what led up to it. We have to go back to the beginning. The project started, as I have previously stated, University of Chicago, 1931, with Dr. John Hutchinson, Nikola Tesla, and a staff as assist, Dr. Emil Kurtenauer. The important point here in the history we have to follow is what happened in terms of Tesla. In 1934, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected president of the United States. 33 years elected, and he became actual president in March of 34. In those days, it was March 20th. They've changed the date to 20 January since. And when he was in office, he invited his old friend Nikola Tesla down to Washington, as they have known each other since 1917, exchanging amenities, and uh, President Roosevelt asking Tesla, well, what have you been up to? What have you been doing? And of course, the president already knew about the ongoing work on Project Invisibility, but there were other things Tesla had been into which were exchanged. And among other things, Tesla mentioned the fact that he had been in communication with extraterrestrials. Now this very much intrigued the president, who unknown to the general public, was very much interested in metaphysics and rather abstruse matters. He was very curious about this, and uh, Tesla told him a little bit about it. The equipment had been developed for such communication by RCA, which Tesla had been a member, a staff member since 1919. And in 1935, he became vice president and director of engineering and research worldwide, a post he held in 19, until 1939 when he retired from RCA. In that period of time, he developed some super sensitive receivers, basically designed for RCA's use in overseas communication and also a few transmitters here and there, all of which came in usefully to Tesla in his ongoing quest for knowledge. So he told FDR he had been in communication with several groups. Roosevelt was curious, can I talk with them? And uh, Tesla said, definitely, now I can arrange it if you wish, and he did. After which Roosevelt decided he would like to meet some of these people. And I asked Tesla, is this possible? And he says, I believe it is. He said, there's two groups principally you might be interested in talking with. And he says, if you have in mind making any kind of a deal, because at that time, as everyone knows, we were in the midst of a terrible depression. And Roosevelt was looking for some means to get out of it, to end it. In those days, he was perhaps a little bit more altruistic than might have been the case later. So arrangements were made to meet two groups. First, the Pleiadians, and then later, a K group, as I call them, the Kondrashkin. He met first with the Pleiadians. They gave a pitch as to what they might be able to do to help. He says, fine, but I want to talk with the other group first before I make a decision. So we talked with the second group and decided in favor of the second group. And the Pleiadians at that point bowed out. And as a matter of fact, went over to Nazi Germany and made a deal with Hitler. 
which we'll not get into because that's another long story, but it does figure in the background precedent to World War II and the development of German technology. So Roosevelt accepted their offer of help in which they said they would provide some new industries and other things. 1938, an offer was made to set up the entire new industry called atomic energy, which of course we have today. The Ro President Roosevelt was very uh, interested and very receptive to the idea. And he consulted with his various advisors and the military, and the military says, whoa. If you let aliens set up an industry like this, even though it's on our home turf, and they are in essence controlling it and know where it can go, what happens? We do not have true control over it. What's going to happen in the future? Will we become vassals or slaves to them? The military advised against it, and Roosevelt turned his mind against it and so advised them, and they became upset and says, well, there's nothing else we can do for you, and disappeared into the woodwork. Well, in those days, of course, we did have intelligence apparatus, but it was not anywhere as near as efficient as today, and they did not have all, of, have all of the niceties of spying, which we have now. So by 1940, Roosevelt was becoming very concerned. Where have these characters gone? What are they doing? They were quite literally vanished, as far as we could determine, or I should say the president and the staff could determine. He says, what are we going to do about this? Well, somebody came up with a bright idea. Mr. President, why don't we go out and find some of those psychics that are running around here and see if we can find some really good ones and maybe they can tell us where they are and what they're doing. The president said, fine. Harry Bennett, who was then the president's right-hand advisor, was appointed the task of finding some good psychics and setting up a secret organization. He did. That organization, founded in 1940, later became known as the Psychor important for many reasons. It has been, until recently, the backbone and mainstay of some very high-level spying operations and uh, intelligence on which many agencies have depended. Now, that organization in its infancy in 1940 was set up by hired psychics who could prove they had their stuff and they together and knew what they were doing and could prove it. And they were given new identities and put in a secret warehouse in Arlington, Virginia, at least initially and went about their tasks. Whether or not they ever found any missing key people, I don't know. But that organization expanded. It was set up to be a permanent organization, and of course, Harry Bennett had to look for a man to head it up and organize it, train the people, and set up a total program. They found such a man in late 1940. He was hired in 1941, and he set up the training programs and uh, from that point on, they were looking basically for pairs, identical pair twins, which were ideal for the type of training they were doing, mostly male, some female pairs. And if they couldn't find them as time went on, they did use computers to computer match, but this came up later. Eventually, the CIA was formed. They took over the organization. And that was in 1947, about 1950, NSA came into being, and they inherited the Psychor, and it's been on the control of NSA ever since. So what did they really do, and what function did they serve? As time went on, and they expanded, and they did expand into about 50 operating pairs at their peak, they were perfect spies. They could penetrate virtually anything on this planet. And of course, after World War II was over, they were very interested in what they could do in terms of spying on Russia. Uh, perhaps unbeknownst to us at first, the Russians also set up their own group, and there were several groups set up in other countries. But I'm only concerned with what happened here. The man who was chosen to head this organization up and actually remained its director until he retired in 1984 was a gentleman by the name of Emil P. de Costain. Perhaps some of you have heard the name. I know a few people have, but very few, because he was very much undercover. He was born in 1900. A very unusual thing I found out about him, which hardly anybody knew about until after he retired. He was himself a walk-in. I guess who? The K Group. So if you want to do some spying on the organization that's spying on you, take over the directorship, and they did. Important for a reason because of what it led into in terms of the two experiments. The 
Philadelphia experiment, as I previously stated, locked up at the Phoenix Project, and it could only lock up on a very critical date. And that critical date was the 12th of August, 1943, and the 12th of August, 1983. Theoretically, it could have locked up in 1963, but there was no ongoing experiment at that time, such as the Phoenix Project, which was required. Dr. John Van Neumann was, of course, the second and final director of the Philadelphia Experiment. He was also the first director of the Phoenix Project when it came online after the war, and it went through several phases. But the important phase of the Phoenix Project was from 1975 through 1983 when they developed the capability of time travel and the time tunnels, as Dr. Carl Sagan liked to call them, the wormholes in space were models in space and time. They had the capability and was fully functional. Someone had to know in order to get these two experiments on either end to lock up that there were critical dates in which it would work and the rest of the years in between it would not work. And someone had to communicate this information to both ends. And this is the thrust of my discussion and what happened and why this whole thing locked up and what some of the mechanics of, and technology of time is all about. I have a few slides I will add and put in here a little bit later, but I want to get into some more of this material first. The director of the Psychor himself was obviously a psychic. He went on through the period of time and because he was a member in essence of the K group, and most of your aliens have the capability of time travel, they knew what was going on at both ends. 